this week's drive, we take a tumble in Japan, sample a small Mercedes, rumble in Russia, and stuff an even smaller Mercedes, all in this week's drive. We opened this week's program with the shock postponement of a deal to bring Grand Prix racing to Russia. Moscow Mayor Yuri Lushkov met Formula One Supremo Bernie Eccleston's team in Moscow for the signing and announced the delay then. Eccleston and Tom Walkinshaw looked baffled and surprised as their translator gave them the news. We have postponed the signing for a month because we do not agree on several points in the contract, Lushkov said. The delay came at the last minute as a crowd of journalists and television crews were ready to film the signing ceremony. The Moscow circuit, projected to cost more than $100 million, is due to be built at Nagatino on a bend in the Moskova River, a few kilometers southeast of the city center. The unexpected delay in the signing of the deal further delays the start of Formula One racing in Russia. Over the years, there have been many public relations attempts to galvanize interest and put Moscow on the lucrative Formula One map. During his initial visit to Moscow last year, Eccleston had said that it was all systems go. It is the FIA Formula One World Championship, and it's about time we had a round of that championship in Russia, and in particular Moscow. Now, we're going to do the, as, as soon as possible. If they could build the circuit sort of next week, well, I suppose that's a bit short. But uh, as soon as the circuit's ready, we'll be here. Driver David Coulthard and his complete McLaren had gone for a zero-gravity flight in the so-called Vomit Comet as a publicity stunt for the event. The Russian transport plane climbed steeply on a parabolic flight path and in the transition between climb and descent, the contents of the padded hold become weightless for a few seconds. Coulthard also got to play at being Superman, flying over his car. But for the moment, plans of a Russian Grand Prix would seem to be up in the air. With the rain-lashed Japanese Grand Prix, the 53-year history of the 500cc Grand Prix class came to an end. The advent of 990cc four-stroke engines beside the two-strokes was expected to be a close battle, but the wet conditions proved the downfall of many top riders. Australian Gary McCoy dropped his two-stroke Yamaha early in the race. Championship runner-up Max Biaggi crashed his new four-stroke Yamaha soon after, much to the Romans' annoyance. Yamaha's challenge to Honda's world champ Valentino Rossi was then left to Spaniard Carlos Checa. Having crashed in practice on both Friday and Saturday, Rossi was taking his time in passing local rider Akira Rio. The conditions also tripped up Suzuki's former world champ Kenny Roberts. Eventually, only 12 of the 21 starters were left upright when the flag fell. Rossi, riding with uncommon restraint, slipped by Rio to take the lead but the wet conditions prevented the direct comparison of the old and the new style engines. The 23-year-old champion was asked if he felt the race was important. Yes, it's a special moment for sure because it's the first race of this new series. And uh, also this, uh, okay. also this, uh, this uh, victory is more important than normal for me because uh, Friday and Saturday crash and uh, we know exactly our potential on uh, dry condition for sure is, is possible to try to win, but, but on wet condition we don't know. No new engines in the 250 class, which stays with the quick and nimble two strokes from half a dozen Japanese and European manufacturers. Local entrant Osamu Miyazaki took an early lead on his Yamaha ahead of Harishika Ayuki. Aprilia's Randy Dupinay of France made up time from a bad start and getting past Aoki too. Aprilia had filled the front five grid positions in the dry, but had been swamped in the wet race. Fonzi Nito, nephew of Spanish superstar Angel, crashed his Aprilia. Miyazaki took his first Grand Prix win ahead of another local, Honda rider Sake, 
neither race in the full world championship. Depunay grabbed the first podium of his career by finishing third after a tough battle with Aoki, who crashed out on the final corner of the race, trying to pass the Frenchman. Conditions were even worse for the 125cc class, where world champ Manuel Poggiali was riding with an injury. Wet weather specialist Arno Vincent took an early lead. Poggiali of San Marino and Italian Lucio Cecinello traded second and third places. Beside racing 125s, Cecinello also owns a 250 team. Vincent pulled away to win and Cecinello dropped back as Mirko Giansanti took over second place, leaving the world champion third. The MotoGP goes next to the high altitude circuit at Velcom in South Africa and is almost guaranteed a dry race. Over in the US, the Samsung Radio Shack 500 NASCAR race in Fort Worth, Texas was rained out from its Sunday spot and rescheduled to the next day. Still, a crowd of 185,000 was on hand for the event. Matt Kenseth had to start at the back of the 43-car grid after changing an engine before the race, but was able to get to the front after 313 laps. Mark Martin tried unsuccessfully to pass second place Jeff Gordon for the last 21 laps of the race. The dogfight for second place gave Kenseth the chance to extend his lead to the final flag. Kenseth's previous win this year was at the Subway 400 at North Carolina in February. His first Winston Cup victory came at the Coca-Cola 600 two years ago. To save vital time, his pit crew had changed only two tyres instead of all four during the final pit stop on lap 309. Italy now, where changing weather meant great testing conditions for the world champions Formula One team. Ferrari took the unusual step of delaying the debut of their new car this year, saying it wasn't ready. The old car was still good enough for a couple of early wins, but relentless testing of the new car went on between races. Basically, I'm very pleased about the season has gone. We have done two races with the old car. We scored 14 points, and that was far more than we anticipated uh, before we started the season. Every race is held in Italy is special. Uh, and Imola is one of those which we have uh, huge support for Ferrari. We have done very good races there. We didn't have such a good one last year, obviously, so we have to make up uh, something for last year. Team number two, Rubens Barrichello, had to wait a little longer to get his shiny new car. Both drivers were in their new cars at Imola and scored a convincing 1-2. Well, the new car is, is better because it's is a, probably an easier car to drive. Uh, it's, it's difficult to set up because it's a, it's a more extreme car. It's, 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 you really have to, to pay attention when you do the setup because it's a quicker car. And it's, it's, I mean, I, I guess how, how difficult it is to build a car that is, uh, is better than an already good car. Just a quarter of the way into the season is too early to make predictions, but the men from Maranello have made the rest of the paddock look like they're the ones going backwards. This is the car that almost wasn't. Within months of the launch of the original Mercedes-Benz A-Class in October 1997, it was at the center of the Moose Test fiasco. 
Swedish journalists performed a drastic collision avoidance swerve as part of their road test, and the car rolled over, prompting global criticism of the brave new design. The A-Class was a radical change for Mercedes. A small, front-wheel drive, one-box city car with a tiny, by Mercedes standards, 1400cc engine, and styling a long way from the regular, staid star of Stuttgart three-box saloon. But Mercedes had invested lots of time and money in the A-Class, and they weren't about to let it, well, roll over and die. The factory sharpened their design pencils and decided to modify the suspension and fit high-tech electronic stability control devices as standard. That was five years ago, and the A-Class has survived and thrived. But it was still a small car, especially in the back. Even moderately tall people in the front seats could make things really tight for anyone in the back seat. And there were some who criticized the interior as being beneath the standards expected in a Mercedes-Benz. So the factory revamped the car again. They gave it a classier interior. A new design dashboard with all new plastic parts, typical Benz switches, some wood trim and class-leading safety technology, four airbags, an upgraded stability control and electronically assisted brakes. But the only option available to the highly specified vehicle are curtain window airbags, as used on the top drawer S-Class Super Saloon. And there's the huge sunroof. It concertinas separate panels to the rear and really lets all the sunshine in. The range includes a 1600 and a 1900. We have the A190. It's a feature-packed but heavy little car, weighing a bit over a ton. Mercedes also stretched their baby by 170 millimeters, or about seven inches, giving the back row as much leg space as its E-Class big brother. The rear seats can be folded, moved forward, or removed altogether, giving variously the space of a luxury sedan or a large station wagon, or somewhere in between. And even with all the seats in place, luggage space is reasonable. At the other end, the engine isn't very inviting. All the plastic covers hide the technical bits, but the fuel-injected motor gives an unremarkable 92 kilowatts, or about 125 horsepower. The engine is designed to slide under the floor in a crash. For the driver, probably the oddest feature is the clutchless manual gearbox. You drive it exactly like a manual, but there's no third pedal. You get used to it quickly enough and can even blip the throttle on downshifts. Basically, the system declutches when you touch the gear lever. The stability control feels if the car is beginning to slide and cuts power and applies the brakes as needed. The latest version is less obvious, and often the only thing you know is the flashing warning light in the big speedometer. It may be small, but the A-Class feels very much like a Mercedes. summer sees the London Motorcycle and Scooter Show. The industry is worth two and a half billion pounds to the UK economy and it's expected that this will rise steadily in coming years. The number of bikes sold in the UK has trebled from 50,000 in 1990 to 169,000 in 2001. Every big city has traffic congestion problems and the ease with which bikes can cut through heavy traffic is a key factor in renewed interest in two-wheelers. There are two real bike markets. One's the traditional lifestyle bike market. That'll always be there. That's Harley Davidson's and uh, Hell's Angels, and we all have a touch of that in us. But the big market's the commuter market. Because they're fast, because they cut through traffic, because they're cheap, because they're environmentally friendly, you know, they're affordable, they don't pay congestion charging. That's where the growth is. I think we expect to see the scooter market in particular growing very, very rapidly in the next decade. CCM is a boutique British bike maker, building road, trail and supermoto bikes around a single-cylinder Suzuki engine. Supermoto is a type of light, powerful and nimble bike, ideally suited to high-density traffic like that in and around London. Peter Swift is managing director of CCM. As a British manufacturer, it's very important for us to have a significant market share in the UK market. Now, the sector we're in, which is dual sport and supermoto, is absolutely exploding this year. But 45% of all motorcycles are sold in the southeast. So the London Motorcycle Show is the ideal place to showcase our products. Most factories had displays showcasing their new models ranging from the big tourers and sports bikes to more laid-back custom trikes and the latest avant-garde scooters.
and if the glam, glitter and gleaming chrome got too much, there were the stunt rider displays to watch, indoors of course. You can't trust the English weather that much. Still on two wheels, but a long way from the latest high-tech offering in London, it seems Russian bikers are taking their riding very seriously these days. In fact, so seriously that they've designed their own motorcycle. This is the Moscow Night Wolves Motorcycle Club, led by a man known only as Surgeon. Their clubhouse, the Bike Center. It would be a dream come true for any bike club to have their very own bike put into production. But for the Night Wolves, that dream has become reality. The club came up with a design for their dream machine, the Wolf, the brainchild of the sharp-thinking surgeon. Russia should have its own Russian bike, with its own legend and with its own name. And this new bike, which we, the Night Wolves, have designed, is called Wolf. Because it was created by the Night Wolves. The main thing about it is that it's special. When you are riding a Japanese bike, for example, you're one of many. But when you are riding a wolf, especially if it was tuned by our wolf engineers, then even people who don't know much about bikes will turn their heads and stare. Like many citizens of the former communist states, Russians are pretty good at fixing things and keeping machines running. But as barriers fall, more and more imported machines are becoming available, and some worry that Russian industry will lose its identity. If the wolf looks at all familiar, it's because it's based on the Ural, a long-running design itself loosely based on a World War II-era BMW. Before the collapse of communism in the town of Irbit in the Russian Urals, Ural Motor used to build up to 150,000 bikes a year. With falling production levels and sales, Ural Motor bosses apparently jumped at the chance of producing the Wolf. Initially, the first models of the Wolf were only available for sale in Russia. Ural Motor designers held back from offering the bike for sale on foreign markets. They wanted to further improve its design. Vadim Triopichkin is the director of the Irbert motorcycle plant. As of this year, we started exporting Wolf bikes, and it was a very pleasant surprise for us when we realized that it's becoming ever more popular. We export it to many countries in Europe and to America. Far from the rutted roads and industrial heartland of Russia, the Wolf is on sale in Banbury, in England's Oxfordshire. A standard wolf will cost around 78,000 rubles, or $2,800 in Russia, cheap for a custom motorcycle of its type, but prices rise sharply for export. Despite a price tag of £4,200 sterling, the wolf has picked up a following in Britain and sales are expected to increase. David Angel owns the shop where the Russian bikes are sold. I think it's the fact that it's a custom that doesn't look like a Harley Davidson, which makes it sell because a Harley Davidson has the V-twin. All the Japanese companies that are doing customs have basically tried to copy a Harley Davidson. This is something unique. This is, it's still a custom bike, it's still got the forward controls, but it hasn't got the V-twin engine. And, and people are, some people are tired of the V-twin thing. You know, we've seen it, we've done it, we've been there. This is new. The Wolf is a flat twin 750cc, giving a modest 29 and a half kilowatts of power. It has a four-speed gearbox and holds 23 litres of fuel. The Ural won the Narodnia Marka, the People's Brand Prize, 
given to companies that have won the love and reliance of Russian consumers. Will the new kings of the road be riding Russian motorcycles? Only time will tell. Two countries, one two-seated car, and national pride okay. at stake. So, okay. In a Germany versus England clash, two teams from each country dressed in team football kit gathered in London's Trafalgar Square to take part in the world record the smart car stuffing competition. And we've already got three in the back. England won the toss and elected to go first. With an adjudicator from the Guinness Book of Records acting as referee, both teams were aiming to beat the existing world record set in 1999 in Germany and stuff as many people as possible into a two-seater smart car, which is built by Mercedes-Benz. The national pride of both teams was at stake as crowds of tourists watched both teams attempting to get 15 team members into the smart. Preparations for both teams included a spot of light jogging and stretching on the spot. One girl said being pushed and shoved was much like a trip on the London Underground. To compete, each of the finalists had to be at least five feet tall and over the age of 18. German team members in white shirts watched how the English were doing it. To win, the doors of the car had to remain shut for at least 10 seconds before a result was declared. Even that was going to be a long time for some. In the first round, England squeezed 13 people into the smart. When the whistle blew on the final round, England had crammed 14 people into the tiny car with an extra person on the dashboard. Having seen what they needed to beat, the German team started to pack in. Germany was penalised for breaking the rearview mirror, but they had managed to draw with England with a score of 13 all in the first round. Pressure was too much for Germany, whose second attempt went into extra time, and they finally had to concede defeat through injury. The final round score was England 14, Germany 13. Well, that's all for this week's drive, but next week we'll look at more two- and four-wheeled news and action, and take a drive in the new Honda CRV. So make sure you come along for the drive. <laughs>